God compares an akazu so that my household can be full. So when a principality brings government, you need another agent to compare people to come. You can build a church, but to be empty. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. There is no creature and there is no being on earth and in the whole universes of God that is eternal, self-existent, immutable, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Only God is. And that's why only him is God. And that is what makes him deity. Every other being they call deity, they call them deity because they don't have understanding. That's why I said, I am the Lord, there's none beside me. Because men in their ignorance may call other spirits deity. There's no spirit that has these attributes. Only God possesses them. This is what makes him deity. The one who qualifies to be worshipped. Then he has moral attributes. Moral attributes are the things that makes him divine. And those are the ones he shares with his creation. Like I showed you from 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. When he said we are partakers of his divine nature. So when we say we are like God. We are saying we are like God in his moral attributes. Not in his essential attributes. If we become like God in his essential attributes. We will become deity. But we are not. But we are like God in his moral attributes. Because he shares them with us. And these moral attributes make us stand out amongst all the creature creation in the visible realm. I give you four of them very quickly because we are trying to have an understanding. Number one, perfect holiness. God is perfectly holy. And what does that mean? He is completely separate and incorruptible. It's a sinless state of existence separated and incorruptible you can't corrupt god with evil he is perfectly holy in fact the beauty of god comes from his holiness so when you study holiness in its origin you'll discover that it expresses beauty it's a state of absolute consecration where nothing external has the capacity to defy that's who god is he exists in his own class, separated unto himself. Revelation 15, 4. The Bible said, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. So any being that has tendency of holiness is because God shared with him. And even at that, we have not been able to attain perfection in holiness. Only God sits there. And so when God speaks, you need to know that he is talking from a realm where no creation is. If you make the mistake of comparing God with anything, you have set yourself up. And that's the problem of many believers. They don't know that he's perfectly holy. So when they read the word of God, and God says, you are the head and not the tail. They are comparing it with what the government is saying to them. Because they don't know that God is holy. Where he talks from, no one dwells there. So when God talks to you, it is done. If you know that it's the Holy One talking. If you don't know these things as the foundation of your existence, you can never be mighty with God. Go and ask most of the men doing great things. Most of them, when God spoke to them, they didn't look like it. But they knew that the one talking is not a president. The one talking is not one of the kings of the earth. They knew the one talking is the holy one. And his words are distinct from every other person. God himself was talking. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away. Not one jot or tittle of my word will fail. He is the holy one that spoke. My word is different from every other. Number two. He is... He, he is perfectly righteous. That means he's absolutely right at all times. Now, this is God's mark of distinction in glory. His righteousness. And his righteousness is not just sinlessness. His righteousness 
is a state of power that makes it impossible for him to err. So, when God looks at you, you think you are dark. And they say, fair man. When you check yourself, you'll discover you are fair. And you didn't just become fair. You will discover you have always been fair. You and everybody saw you wrong. That's the power. So the power does not make you fair. It can change time and recalibrate your existence immediately. That's, the, that's what I thought. That's why the Bible said in Romans 5.17, it said they will receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. It didn't say they shall just live above sin. Yes, when you are righteous, you have the power to live above sin. 1 John 3, 7. My little children, let no man deceive you. He said, him that is righteous, him that doeth righteousness is righteous. So a righteous man should live above sin because righteousness is power over everything around you. So you should rule above sin. But it's beyond that. Righteousness makes you a king. You reign in life. Because when you talk, your words causes things to change. How do you think Jesus told them in John chapter 2? Oh, the wine is out. It's not yet my time. Whatever he tells you to do, do. And he told them, fill the water pot. And they filled it with water. No prayer. Take it to the governor of the feast. What happened there? Is the power to cause things to align. That's righteousness. So long as Jesus saw that water as wine, it must become wine. It's a realm of authority. See, if you don't know righteousness, your prayer won't be powerful. That's why most of us are praying, 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 not having result. When you decide something to be in a particular way a force is released to make it so that's why god shares his holiness with us so that we can live above corruption and he shares his righteousness with us so that we can create change so if i come and i see somebody sick if i keep seeing that person sick no matter how i pray he won't be healed but if i see that person healed if i lay hands he will be healed if i send the handkerchief he'll be healed if I say be healed, you'll be healed. Because I have released the power to cause change. That power exists in God. That's what is called righteousness. Inability to err because whatever he thinks or says is so. That's the one who is speaking to us. And that's why God can look at you. You are indebted to the tune of one billion. And he looks at you and says, borrower to nations. And you are wondering, when will I pay my debt? Before you are talking, you are not talking my friends and family. Nations, how will it happen? He's a righteous one who spoke. He's a righteous one. If he needs to give you wisdom, he will give you. To create something that will change your state. And if he doesn't give you wisdom, he can give you favor to make that money come to you. Because it's one thing to create a system that makes money. It's another thing to create a system that brings money to you. And that's not all. He can make you to reap where you did so. <laughs> because the one talking is beyond the law of agriculture. Please respect sowing and reaping. Oh, be hard working. Work hard. As a man sows, that's what he reaps. But Jesus said, I've sent you to reap from where you did so. Where you didn't bestow labor. So you don't only prosper by labor. You also prosper by righteousness. That's why God can look at you and say, you are a blessing to your generation. He can use hard work to make it happen. He can give you wisdom to make it happen. He can give you favor to make it happen. There are too many systems to make it possible. Because when he talks, everything aligns to it. These are the foundations for rotting wonders. Unfathomable. Number three. God is perfect love. And this is beyond emotion. Love can manifest in the form of emotion. But love actually is the power to be able to give yourself unconditionally. Expecting nothing in return. Only God works like that. If God were to transact with us, we are not worth anything from his realm. Because everything God doeth, the Bible said it abides forever. All his blessings to us are eternal. What are we going to give in return? Even our soul that we lost, the Bible said there's nothing we shall give in exchange for our soul. So we are already bankrupt. The reason we can come into glory and walk with God is because He is perfect love. And that love is demonstrated through sacrifice. The ability to give up Himself so that you prosper. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
1 John 4, 8, God is love. Romans 5, 8, why we were yet seen as Christ died for us. So this is not about what we did. It's about who he is. He is perfect love so he can bless us unconditionally. Sir, you need to know this. So that when you approach God, the things you are trusting him for, your merit can credit it to your account. There are many people who approach God, they want to take nations and they are telling God about their impact. <laughs> you are joking. Go and ask the Pharisees. What they did, you can't do half. And I'm not discouraging you from walking and laboring in the spirit. But I'm telling you that what God wants to do for you, you can't merit it. We have this treasure in 18 vessels. That the excellency might be of God and not of man. See, what God wants to bless you with, in a lifetime you can't pay for it. That's why when you come to him, come, he died for us. And then finally, under his moral attributes, God is perfect faithfulness. That means, if God needs to die for what he promised you to happen, he will. And that's why Jesus died. Because there was no price that could be paid to save man. God had to give up himself to save man. And God descended from his throne of glory, became a man, and died a shameful death of a criminal. That is a faithfulness that cannot be imaginable. It cannot be fathomable. That's who God is. This is the premise from whence you can begin to trust God for limitless possibilities. For endless possibilities. Because in his essential attributes, he has the power and the character to make it happen. In his moral attributes, he also has the power and the character to make it happen. And finally, his offices. I give you two of them quickly. God is creator. He doesn't form, he creates. One who forms produces things from existing ones. A creator produces things from non-existent ones. He doesn't need a raw material to, to produce things. That's who he is. And only him is creator. In the beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no raw material, anything, anywhere. And so what that means is that when you are approaching God, don't look at facts. It will be your limitation. It's a day that observe lying vanities, forsake their messes. He said, as thou knowest not how the bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child, so also knoweth not thou the ways of the spirit. Some of us are expecting God to do something and our focus is everywhere. Lord, eh, lift me up. Lord, promote me. Meanwhile, in our mind, we are hoping that our colleague will talk to somebody who knows somebody. And our faith is in our colleague, not God. God can use your colleague, but your faith can't be in your colleague. That was what happened to Joseph. For 14 years, he was in prison. When you return, please talk to the king about me. The guy left and forgot. <laughs> and God kept him there. The Bible said, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. You must zoom from your colleague, zoom from your friends, zoom from men and put your confidence in God. So that the one who creates from nothing can speak and things can happen. And when Joseph showed up, nobody mentioned the butler. He appeared before the king and God began to deliver wisdom through him. That was why when the king asked him, you know so much. He said, this answer is not with me, it's with God. This time around, he has learned something that is not about who you know. It's about God that is faithful to you. And so you stick with him. He can use anybody and anything, but your confidence will never be in things. And I'm telling you, these are some of the hardest things for us to do as men. Because we have been trained and programmed to live depending on facts and the visible realm. Meanwhile, our reality is regulated from the invisible realm. If you know that you are dealing with a creator, when the facts don't align, it will not perturb you. You will know that although the clouds may not be dark, but the valley will be filled with rain. Because the one you are dealing with is creator. He can use the available resources and even if there's no available resources, he is still not limited. He is creator. Number two, 
office that God occupies is that he is life giver. That means he has the power to animate anything, even if that thing were to be dead. This is where God uses things. If something is dead, if a situation is hopeless, he can turn it around. So wherever you find yourself, God can still change your story. So when we are talking about limitless possibilities, endless possibilities, we are not talking to the relatives of the governor. We are not talking to those who are working in the oil company. We are not talking to those who have car industries or car companies in Enugu. We are talking to everybody and anybody who can believe. He said there is hope for a tree that is cut off. For at the scent of water it will sprout again. God is life giver. He can give life to your purpose. He can give life to your vision. He can give life to your body. That thing that you think is over may be the best place God wants to start from. Because sometimes he will allow Sarah to be barren and Abraham to become impotent. So that when Isaac comes, you will only call him praise. There's no other thing you can call him because you know that he came only from God. Because this one has to be a function of the life giver. This is the foundation of our confidence. And this is why we can expect our lives to command dimension that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has occurred to the hearts of men. Now let me show you a few men in scripture who believed these things and see what they did in their generation. Number one, Abraham. <laughs> you know, God took Abraham through a school. As a young man, working with his father, they had some resources that naturally he will anchor his confidence on. And God told him, Genesis 12 from verse 1 to 3, get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. Come to the land that I will show you. If you leave your country, where will you go to? <laughs> you don't have citizenship again. <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? That is when I will bless you. Abraham carried Lot with him, packed some things, some animals. He was looking for security. If you have any other security apart from me, I can't left Abraham. Genesis 13, 14. Wonders began. And the first wonder I saw in Abraham's life was in Genesis 14 verse 14 and 15. The Bible said four nations ganged up against Sodom and Gomorrah. Although the king of Sodom and Gomorrah also invited some of his other friends. But four nations ganged up against them. And they defeated them and took Lot and his family and the whole of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham heard the news. The first thing to do is to wait. Which, which king is that? How many soldiers did he bring? Do they have chariots? You need to do some studies to know who you are going up against. The Bible said Abraham stood up took 318 trained servants in his house. Yes, they are trained, but they've never gone to war. You are dealing with a king who came from one battle and invaded another battle and still conquered. So you are dealing with soldiers who have been warriors from their youth. And this is a gang up. And when kings win war, their morale is high. That's not a place to take servants to. But the Bible said, in Genesis 14 verse 14 it said Abraham divided himself among them and when I started studying that scripture there are two possible explanations one is a theological explanation the other is a prophetic explanation the theological explanation is that Abraham divided his army into four so that they will conquer from different angles but that's not what happened what happened was a prophetic intelligence God taught Abraham a mystery. Because God told Abraham that I will make you a great nation. 
and he said indeed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed that means number one abraham is a nation number two he's the father of all nations so when abraham is competing or fighting against four nations all abraham needs to do is to put the status of nations on everybody around him because he's a nation so abraham put himself in them so when they went it became 319 nations against four nations. That's why that battle did not have casualties. And they won the battle and came back. The question I ask myself is, why do these men know these things? That a man received one word from God and it becomes indestructible. Number one, he wasn't afraid of four nations. Number two, he knew a prophetic and a priesthood technology of weaving himself into people so that all of them will carry the same dimension and they will win battle when they wanted to give him the spoils of war he said i won't take anything from you lest you say you made abraham rich he has caught something in god 